Alright, hey guys and welcome back. We'll be looking at the last two parts of uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League in my spoiler review. Uh, once again, if you guys have not already watched the film, please do watch it first. I do not want to be the one that spoils things for you. Uh, you should be able to just uh, you know decide that for yourself. Uh, Alright, without further ado, let's get into part 6, something darker. So I will be combining part 6 and the last part, which is part 7. It's sort of an, it's it's labeled as an epilogue and it's not very long. So uh, I'll, I'll show you the, the name of the epilogue shortly, uh, but this is part 6. So to start off, uh, we do know that Superman has uh, been brought back to life. He, uh, you know, you see a shot of him uh, in, you know, in, the, in his farm uh, next to his uh, old house with Lois. Uh, his house, of course, is um, currently owned by the bank or something, uh, but regardless, uh, he and Lois are there uh, to visit his place, and uh, they are just looking through some of his old stuff. And these scenes are really emotional, it's just trying to bring Clark back to his senses, and it is working. Uh, he's gradually... Uh, you know, trying to be more calm and collecting himself and regaining his memory. So it seems like it takes time for him to recover after he has been, you know, brought back to life by the mother box, uh, which is something that, uh, you know, has only been done to Superman, right? Cyborg was not dead. He was already alive and uh, the mother box worked on him. So this is pretty much a miracle. Uh, and considering he didn't turn out to be Doomsday, it is definitely a miracle. Uh, right after that, you get a shot of the League finally visiting uh, Alfred in, you know, Dark Knight's cave. They've never come to the Batcave before. Previously, they were only in Batman's hangar. Now they're finally in the cave and Batman brings them in. And I love this part, how everyone is just, um, you know, so alien to the cave. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, the, you know, I like, uh, how Bruce Wayne says, everyone, this is Alfred, I work for him, and it's all very casual, no one questions it, uh, everyone just, uh, just, you know, it's just like, oh, right, okay, fine, um, they don't really, I, I like that, the subtlety in that joke, I think everyone knows, uh, uh, Bruce mentions it, uh, with the intention, I mean, he, the Bruce's intentions when he actually mentions that. So that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, and also, uh, they go to his bad computer and they actually start analyzing the possibility of detecting the mother box. Uh, and while they are working on it, they actually find out where Steppenwolf's base is located. They find out that he's actually uh, harvested the radiation or something to, to build his base. Therefore, the radiation levels there are now safe for humans to go to. So this is very, very different from the 2017 version where there was some Russian family. Uh, we don't get to see any Russian family in this. Uh, in this one, it's an abandoned area completely because of the radiation. And, uh, you know, Steppenwolf uses that radiation to create his base. Therefore, only now it is safe for humans to enter. Uh, so right after that, uh, you know, they have the conversation with Victor. And Victor says, I'm the only one who is able to actually go inside and take out the mother boxes. I just need, a, you know, a charge and a way to get there safely. So the League is going to, you know, plan to fight everyone to get there safely and uh, Flash is going to use his, uh, you know, speed force to build up a charge and charge Victor so that he can invade the mother boxes. And that seems to be their, the gist of their plan. They're not very sure about it, but they do know that there's a possibility that most of them will die, and especially Cyborg uh, has, you know, having the higher highest risk of death, being that he's going to go up against these super powerful uh, alien. Uh, you know, world-building machines uh, known as the Mother Boxes. So it is a terrifying challenge, but they do believe that he's the only one with the capability, so they don't really have much of a choice. Uh, and of course, um, Batman is like, you know, uh, we don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells, he's never fought us, not as united. All this is very inspiring, uh, very Batman, uh, being the leader of the League, I think. Uh, it would have been nice if we uh, actually got the rest of the League, right? Anyway, uh, we got we cut back to a scene in the farm where uh, you know Superman is finally more relaxed. He's calm. He's looking around in the uh, kind of uh, it looks like a cornfield. I could be wrong. Uh, it looks like a cornfield to me. And uh, he he realizes that Lois is finally wearing the ring. And the ring, uh, you know, it's like the wedding ring that Lois uh, kept aside when Superman. You know, he, when he died. Uh, but uh, he, he says, I take that as yes. And uh, he's quite happy. And I think I think all this is just uh, 
basically Superman knows what's happening. He knows that there is a child, but none of that is ever said into any dialogue. And I love the parallels in this scene of Superman playing around with this butterfly. If you guys watched A Man of Steel, you would have seen the same butterfly being stuck in like some kind of a metal chain. And I think this means that uh, you know, all this while clock has been holding back, right? Superman has been holding back and uh, in BVS he was finally forced to unleash it because he has to uh, do everything he can to save the world. And now he has nothing to lose, right? He has lost everything once, he has died, he has come back and he feels like he is free once again uh, only to eventually realize that despite having something to live for, uh... You know, if something were to happen to Lois, I think you all know where this is going, right? So, uh, so yeah, uh, he's happy. Uh, he has a wonderful scene with uh, his mom as well, arrives to, to say hi to him. And I love this. It's such an emotional scene, such a beautiful scene. Uh, and, you know, I mean, um, what more can a mother ask for, right? And uh, I love that. I love the shot with him and his, you know, his two beautiful ladies. And uh, you see Barry Allen snacking down on some what looks like chips while Cyborg is trying to fix the troop carrier. And I like Aquaman being like, uh, I never said I didn't care. Uh, you know, it just shows that he's just uh, he's just a hard man. You know, he's just a hard man. He's just tough deep down. Uh, but uh, he he cares. He cares. Which is the only reason he is here. And then you finally, finally get a shot of uh, the Batman, Bruce Wayne, actually telling Wonder Woman, I had a dream that Barry Allen was in the Batcave, uh, you know, telling me that uh, Lois Lane is the key. And Wonder Woman is like, yeah, she has to be the key. Uh, you know, uh, Superman, you know, every heart has one. And she, she is the key for Superman. And, uh, at, you know, at first, you know, I, I, I really feel that Wonder Woman is kind of just knocking it off as some sort of a dream and that, you know, Batman is just imagining it. So, you know, they have not taken the dream sequence seriously yet because obviously it has only happened once to, to Bruce. Um, and, you know, he, he can obviously, obviously brush it off as a dream or some deja vu. You know, if it happens once, it's most likely a dream, deja vu, coincidence, and all these uh, kind of bullshit. But once it happens two or three times, man, then you got to know that something's seriously wrong, right? Which is why at the end of the film, you get to see Bruce Wayne finally having another nightmare sequence. And probably he will take it seriously after that. Because if it just happens once, you could brush it off as a bad dream. But I think the second time it happens, the Batman is not going to let it slide. And you're definitely going to see him come back full force uh, in, you know, in another film if that ever happens. But yeah, um, the, you know, the troop carrier gets fixed by Victor and they go off to uh, fight Steppenwolf. And I like how uh, you know, Bruce Wayne says, Faith, Alfred, Faith. Because Alfred asks, how do you know Superman's going to come? He's like, Faith. And I like that. I like that. It's a really beautiful scene. And uh, we see Steppenwolf having, uh, you know, uh, all three mother boxes at hand is beginning the unity. And as it begins, there's like a loud explosion that is heard across the planet. Uh, it is heard by Themyscirians, Atlanteans, and humans alike. Uh, humans represented by Alfred. And uh, I mean... It really shows you that uh, it's going to catch everyone off guard and the scale of things is going to be crazy. And with uh, the Atlanteans and Themyscirians not united, uh, there is no one really to uh, stop Steppenwolf besides the League because uh, they they don't really want to... They, you know, they find it more difficult to work together uh, with, with the Atlanteans and, and everyone else than to want to even save the world. And I feel that that was kind of weird. Like, uh, if you ask me, uh, the Themyscirians should have fought. They should have joined the battle. But I think it is possible that they realize that the scale of things is too much for them. And uh, they're not ready to fight this war to save the world. And they'd rather just keep to the damage to the minimum by hiding in Themyscira. I felt that this was really... Um, a little bit weird, you know, considering how brave and how uh, the Themyscirians have no fear or whatever. Uh, it's just kind of weird, uh, that, you know, the fact that they just don't want to fight. The same goes for the Atlanteans. Uh, I'm pretty sure even though King Orm is having fun, uh, you know, ruling all of, you know, the ocean, I'm pretty sure if you hear a loud, ex loud explosion, which could mean the end of the world, you do want to try to protect what you have. Uh, and the same goes for the humans. Um, I'm pretty sure that the army and the rest of the world would have detected that there's this huge scale attack alien invasion and they would have joined the fight uh, but uh, you know 
I guess they were all asleep for some reason. But it is highly possible that all of this happened so quick for the humans uh, because, you know, they, they, they are just not battle ready, as you can put it. Uh, but uh, the Themyscirians are the ones who definitely know. The Atlanteans know as well. So I felt maybe the Atlanteans are not united because, you know, the king is not uh, uniting them. Orm is not available. But... Uh, What's the name? Uh, the the Hippolyta is definitely is right. The Amazons are definitely available, but it just shows that the Amazons are not truly ready because they are not united. And I felt that that was just really sad. But it is possible if the next film starts, like in the beginning of the next film, we will actually get context for what is missing. But in this film, it was poorly explained. So uh, the team is actually you know plotting out their plan. They're just going over what each ta each person's tasks are in order to try to shut down the unity before it synchronizes at, as Victor says it. And uh, after that, you cut to a shot of uh, Superman walking through his scout ship, uh, you know, and uh, he's looking for a new suit to wear. And I love this scene. This entire scene was just beautiful, so inspiring. As he walks through the chambers, you can see all the suits open up towards him. Uh, you can see the suit of a female Kryptonian suit. There is uh, one of his space suits as a throwback to the comics where Superman actually wore a space suit uh, because he couldn't breathe in space in one of those versions. Uh, then you get to see a uh, metal armor-like suit that is reminiscent of what uh, his father uh, or rather Kryptonians generally wear. Uh, in Krypton, and then you get to see a another version of the Superman suit, uh, which is you know very much similar to the one that he used to wear. So I think it's pretty much the same suit. It, it, you know, it is there, also available for him. Uh, and you can see, you can hear the voices of his two fathers, uh, Jor-el and uh, Jonathan Kent, both talking in the background, telling him uh, that now it is time for him to make that choice and truly step up and be the kind of the pantheon of uh, you know the you know the the leaders of the human race and uh, superman actually opts to go for the last option which is the black and silver suit probably him making a choice to do something different for once which is to actually live up to the choice that he makes that is uh, you know similar to the suit that he saw jorel wearing because jorel was wearing a black and silver suit uh, when he first makes an appearance in the Man of Steel. So while in this film, uh, unlike the comics, in the comics the black suit acts as some sort of a uh, a recovery suit, but in this film it doesn't look like a recovery suit in any way. It is not explained as a recovery suit in any way, but uh, it is more so reminiscent of what uh, Jorel used to wear. And it is possible that he just feels like he wants to go back to his Kryptonian roots and he wants to show the world that he is a savior and he has come here as a savior figure and he has come to change the world as a Kryptonian, which is why he opted to go for the black and silver suit. Once again, this is just my theory and thoughts. I'm pretty sure that uh, everyone will have their own version of it and pretty sure Zack has the ultimate or rather the penultimate version of it and he will know exactly what his intention is. Uh, the cape flaps are extraordinary the way he manipulates gravity around him and you can hear Jonathan say fly time, uh, fly, fly sun it's time. Man it is so beautiful and you see Superman rise above the earth uh, appearing as some sort of a Jesus figure which is what uh, Zack mentioned are the parallels and just like how he was nuked and he was floating uh, by the planet he also now is floating ready to be their savior and it's also similar to man of steel where you see him floating backwards away from um, Jorel, uh, telling you know Jorel telling him that you can save you can save them you can save all of them and you see him floating backwards that is still him making a decision but now he's floating forwards towards the world with his body face towards the world and i think this parallel really shows you that He's, he has changed after death, right? He has, he's now a different person. He's now clearer with his vision. He knows exactly what he wants to do. And he wants to be Superman. And not because he's just a guy with powers that likes to do something, uh, you know, that likes to help people. But he wants to be something more, something greater, uh, which is what it's meant to be. And you see the League stretching up. They're ready to go and try to save the world. And, of course, they break Steppenwolf's dome and they go in to try to, you know, uh, invade the area. There's a lot of beautiful action sequences with uh, with Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, of course, uh, and uh, Cyborg, nonetheless. A lot of firepower from Cyborg and you see a lot of beautiful scenes. Uh, you know, action is just... There, there's... I mean, there's not there's not much really to comment about the action. I think uh, 
all superhero films, be it uh, you know the likes of Captain America, the likes of the Watchmen, the likes of uh, you know the Iron Man films, all the MCU films, all the DCU films. I think action sequences are, are needed, needed to see some of the best things in these films, and they are absolutely amazing. Uh, so after that, of course, um, the, the the league gathers together, and uh, they are about to invade the place where Steppenwolf is, while Flash is running circles around the entire area where the dome once was so now the dome is gone but flash is running circles to build up a charge to invade the mother box to 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 charge victor to help him invade the mother boxes uh you get a shot you gotta see a shot of uh, superman landing down to meet alfred and uh uh, that's probably how he gets to know where the team is. Alfred is clearly staying out of this fight. As you can see that he's repairing a car. He doesn't uh, feel like he needs to join the fight anymore. And the reason for this is, as I said in my previous episode, uh, Cyborg has now taken the role of Alfred, right? Cyborg is now the new uh, digital god of the league. Uh, so Batman doesn't really need another person manning his his uh, technology uh, anymore. You, you get to see the transition between when uh, he he relies a lot of Alfred uh, with Alfred in the beginning, and then he moves on to where he is with Cyborg, but he still relies on Alfred because he's not very sure about Cyborg. But once he learns about Cyborg's intentions with the Mother Box, once he knows what Cyborg is capable of, and once Cyborg fixes the uh, what do you call this, the troop carrier, Cyborg has taken that role of the uh, kind of the the whiz, uh, digital whiz guy in the team, and he's going to handle things from now on. So Alfred is finally sort of. Uh, living a retirement's life, you can say he's fixing some old car, uh, you know, being paid a visit by Superman. And I felt that was really beautiful to show that finally Alfred can step down and let this young cyborg step up and uh, be that part of the league. And I like that. I really like that. And I feel that that really shows you that cyborg is really, really important to the league. And it, it definitely they would not be able to do all of this without Cyborg, and that's really beautiful. It shows you how much weight the character carries. I feel the only character in this league that was uh, sort of underplayed was Aquaman, but I think um, that was, there were various reasons for that. First of all, is because Aquaman is a sort of a born king leader, and he doesn't get to do much of that because he doesn't have his army, his Atlantean army, and a lot of these fights are on land. If these were in the sea, uh, he's a whole different beast altogether. So I think... Uh, he he has been diminished a little bit, but you still get to see him do some amazing fight scenes, and he's still quite a titan, right? He's capable of standing his ground, and you really don't want to mess with him. That's pretty much true. Uh, Steppenwolf gets some sort of new uh, enlightenment, I feel. His eyes start glowing blue, and after he touches the mother boxes, and he begins to fight, and he looks absolutely terrifying, uh, you know, in the fight, and of course, it takes the entire league... Uh, some effort to try to actually challenge him and uh, you see him trying to reach for Cyborg uh, and you know Wonder Woman tries to break this platform to delay the fight just so that Cyborg can get more time and uh, they're struggling to hold back Cyborg and uh, while all this is happening you actually see something different uh, Steppenwolf is actually telling I, I saw your sister begging for sisters begging for their lives. I watched your island burn. He tells these things to Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman calls him a liar. I felt that there's something really funny going on here. Steppenwolf never taunted people by lying before this. Uh, but now, all of a sudden, he's actually lying to try to distract Wonder Woman. And uh, I have a feeling that it's not a lie. Because the only difference that... Uh, would tell you why he's lying is because his eyes are glowing now. So it is possible that he saw a foreseeable future from the mother boxes uh, that is forming the unity. And we do know for a fact that mother boxes are able to tell the future. Uh, which is why they were able to tell Steppenwolf the location of the uh, anti-life equation, and that it'll be it'll be you know it'll form on Earth, and also uh, it showed Cyborg the possible future uh, when he will bring Superman back to life. And similarly, it's possible that it, it has shown Steppenwolf the future uh, where uh, you know uh, the Themyscirians will be begging for their lives, the island will be burnt, and he is using that to taunt uh, Diana, and he distracts her, so he knocks her back and. Uh, uh, puts her down and also knocks down the Aquaman and he finally comes ready to deliver the killing blow for Cyborg as Cyborg is also preparing to call Flash but before all of that can happen uh, before uh, Steppenwolf is able to land the killing blow on Cyborg Superman finally arrives to the rescue and man there is no better Superman fight scene that we have seen 
uh, in in like just a Superman versus the villain fight. This was insane for Superman fans. And the 2017 version was completely. Um, I mean, it's not like this, right? You get the the right music, you get the 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 real Henry Cavill uh, <laughs> coming out as Zack Snyder's Superman, and it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, we even finally get to see his frost breath, which is some something uh, that we have not seen before. And it is possible that after Superman's rebirth, he has unlocked some new powers, which is why he's able to use this uh, frost breath all of a sudden. And it's also why it's possibly the first thing that he uses once he comes back, because maybe he's testing out his new powers but this is just my theory uh, i could be wrong uh we see him then just you know able to fight uh, steppenwolf he's also right after you know his frost breath he's testing out his heat vision and he obliterates this block and um you you can sort of see he's also testing out his speed as he tries to dodge steppenwolf before punching him and it is possible that he's just flexing himself this is all kind of a warm-up for him I love right after this, we get a shot of Wonder Woman landing down while smiling before she absolutely turns mad lad and obliterates Steppenwolf by blasting him away. <laughs> I thought that shot was really cute. Uh, Gal just smiling before she uh, puts her bracelets together and blasts Steppenwolf. And then Aquaman using his trident to create this kind of uh, wave of energy. Uh, it looks like a flood wave as it knocks Steppenwolf. And Superman comes in with a super punch and the entire fight just goes nuts at this point. right? So Superman just banging down on Steppenwolf. Uh, melting off his horn and uh, the graphics of Steppenwolf I, I have to say is the best uh, graphics I have ever seen uh, on, a, on a fully CGI supervillain it's absolutely gorgeous now you actually see something unique uh, among all the uh, what do you call these parademons, you have never seen much character. But for once, we saw a parad uh, we see a parademon that is like trying to shoot the Flash from afar using a cannon. Uh, actually, time his shot for once because he is not able to shoot the Flash right; it's too fast. But he actually times uh, exactly when Flash will be completing his circle and takes a shot, which does hit the Flash. Uh, Flash crash lands, and while the shot doesn't ex it doesn't hit flash directly it scars him quite a bit and uh, knocks him uh, you know off his feet which uh, you know turns off the charge that he was building and this means that cyborg will not get the charge to enter the unity and uh, just as cyborg is crying out for help we see a boom tube open and uh, we see superman aquaman wonder woman turn back to realize that it is none other than Dark Side, and I love how Dark Side is standing there with his arms behind his back as he turns to face the League. Uh, he is joined together with Granny Goodness and uh, the Sword, and they look absolutely gorgeous. Granny Goodness does look really blurred out, and I think this was done on purpose because they have not decided who will play Granny Goodness. They have not chosen a character, which is why we also do not get any dialogues from Granny Goodness. However, the sword is pretty clear and Darkseid, of course, is really crystal clear in his glory. Like, you will recognize him instantly that that is Darkseid. There's, there's no need for explanations. Uh, and shortly after that, the unity explodes. And uh, when the explosion happens... Barry Allen, who is still trying to catch his breath, just activates the... Uh, he goes into this uh, vibration stance, right? Where he vibrates his molecules so rapidly in order to dodge the oncoming explosion. So this explosion is not something that uh, enwraps the entire world. This is like a short radius explosion that is uh, the beginning of the unity before it starts to forge the planet. Which is why Darkseid didn't come out of the boom tube. Because it is possible that the boom tube is actually protecting him from this energy explosion, or rather this energy field. So Darkseid decided to stay inside that boom tube uh, as this explosion was about to happen. And uh, as you can see, Barry realizing this explosion has spread and killed the entire league. Uh, he has to finally turn back time. He tells himself, you gotta do this, you gotta do it soon. And, he, and you get, like, you know, you get God Snyder at work in this incredible scene of just pure glory. Let me just show you uh, the shot that I have of this. Let me like just go to that part. I need to... It's so difficult to skip on uh, on this HBO or whatever. Uh, how do I... Uh, you know what? I have another. I have another photo of it. There you go. There you go. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And man, we will not get this from anyone else. Trust me on that. So uh, after you see Flash turning back time in in absolute 
you know, boss fashion. He sends the charge into Cyborg, and Cyborg goes into the Unity, and he fights with the Unity in a mental battle, emotional battle, and he defeats them by, you know, because the Unity tries to entice him, it tells him that uh, we can make you whole again and all that, but he's like, no, I'm not broken. And as he defeats the Unity, you can see that they turn into the Three Witches. This is a parallel of the Greek uh, mythology of the Three Witches that have the ability to predict the future, as do the Mother Boxes. The same way the Mother Boxes can predict the future and tell you a foreseeable future, the witches do the same. But if you follow Greek mythology a little bit closely, or even just watch something like the Hercules cartoons, you would know that the witches do not necessarily show you the best future. They show you a lot more of a dark future or the, or the worst possible outcome uh, because uh, they like to see people suffer and that's sort of their thing. And uh, right after Cyborg defeats these three mother boxes, Superman comes in and helps him split them apart and they have been turned off. Steppenwolf is literally impaled by Aquaman uh, through the back of his chest and uh, you know uh, he gets knocked by Superman as Wonder Woman slices down his throat as Steppenwolf's head just uh, falls through the boom tube and Darkseid crushes it. Uh, so I felt that Darkseid at this point realizes that he does not want to walk into this challenge of this Man of Steel together with the League because they seem quite well prepared and uh, Darkseid does not want to be caught off guard because he knows not to underestimate his opponents and uh, he decides to buy his time instead. So step here you get a shot of the Sart finally telling him, I told you the Happen Wolf would fail. And uh, for a second I was like, Oh shit, Desaad, uh, are you sure you want to tell that to Darkseid? But Darkseid, it was actually pretty cool. He was like, yeah, yes, you did. You told me it'll fail. And uh, it doesn't matter. We still got we still got to try to get the anti-life equation. And I felt when he said that, you can see some sort of fear in Desaad's face. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it is because uh, Desaad is actually afraid of the anti-life equation. Uh, whether, you know, he feels that uh, his master would be beyond his reach uh, or whether, you know, he doesn't want to actually uh, lose the lead that they already have uh, because he feels that uh, Earth is not a planet that they need to struggle to capture or something like that. Uh, and then that's it. The Then we get another uh, slightly better shot of Granny Goodness' face and she kind of reminds me of uh, Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones. I forgot the actress's name, but she does remind me of Brianna Tarth, but a lot older version. I wouldn't mind if that actress actually uh, would be the one chosen to play Granny Goodness. That would be pretty awesome um, as well, because she looks absolutely tall and menacing, and Brienne of Tarth is that uh, real, like, godlike figure to play that role. Uh, we finally get a shot of the entire Justice League standing on this sort of a uh, pier, uh, not really pier, it's like the edge of the uh, nuclear re uh, reactor and uh, they're getting ready to, to you know, happily go back home. And uh, the shot is absolutely beautiful and we finally come to the epilogue. And the epilogue is co called A Father Twice Over. Let me pull up that screenshot for you guys. There you go, it's called Epilogue of Father Twice Over, and um, I mean, okay, I like the name, it's not so bad, and uh, it starts off with Silas Stone uh, story, or, you know, to Cyborg of him, you know, remember Cyborg crushed the, the recorder saying that uh, when, when he says, I want to talk to you now as a father, Cyborg crushes it, now we actually get to hear him finish his speech as a father, and uh, Cyborg, you know, it, it's really emotional, I felt that this entire sequence was really beautiful, really emotional, and I absolutely love Cyborg's story. It's such a good story. Such a good uh, arc for that character. Then we also get to see Aquaman uh, going back to look for his father. Uh, and uh, we get to see Ryan Choi take over Star Labs as the new head, uh, as head of nanotechnology. And he gets you know to be in charge of the Superman ship, which means he'll possibly get the technology he needs to, uh, to uh, be the Atom. Now, it is possible that Superman's ship has technology that, uh, um, you know, is is similar to the one being used by Brainiac, because if you all follow the comics, you may know that um, Brainiac was an invention of jor -El. and uh, Brainiac has the ability to shrink and enlarge worlds. So what he does is he, he conquers planets by shrinking them and keeping them to his collection. Brainiac doesn't need the energy from planets or, or some sort of, uh, you know, he, he doesn't consume the energy from planets. What Brainiac consumes is knowledge. He wants to know and 
and kind of own everything. He's like the symbol of gluttony for knowledge. Uh, sort of like Merlin from the Seven Deadly Sins. Maybe not a very good comparison, but still. Uh, so Brainiac likes to shrink and, and keep these planets as his collection. I have a feeling that it is possible that the uh, ship, you know, there's the, the Kryptonian scout ship actually has this technology uh, because, you know, Brainiac is, is related to Jor-El. Jor-El is Kryptonian. Uh, the ship, and then, you know, Ryan Choi gets the, the technology. I think you guys get my point. Okay, I'm just going to go on. So um, after that, we get to see the Hall of Justice. Uh, being ordered to be constructed by Bruce Wayne to Alfred. And we get to see another beautiful emotional scene between Barry and his father, uh, where Barry's telling his dad that he actually got a job and he's going to work in a crime lab or something. Uh, and finally, we get to see uh, Bruce Wayne telling um, Clark Kent that uh, he helped him to buy back his house. And you get to see uh, Martha and Lois walking into the uh, back into their house uh, back into Martha's house uh, with this crib of a, for a child and uh, you clearly know now that Lois is pregnant. Uh, if you still didn't, uh, you get to hear Bruce Wayne say congratulations by the way. So uh, a father twice over, of course, um, Silas gets to be Victor's father's Victor's father twice. Uh, we see Aquaman going to seek his father. We see Flash having conversation with his father and we finally get to see Superman is about to be a father. And I felt all these parallels and these connections were absolutely beautiful. And uh, I mean, the only one who uh, we see at the end, uh, which is not over yet, by the way, uh, we also get a, sh I'll, I'll tell about Batman, right? Uh, Batman is the last in the end, but I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell about him in a while. Uh, Wonder Woman, of course, has no, no parallels to a father, so that's understandable because her, her father is Zeus and, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we all know about Zeus, right? So uh, we see a shot of Batman with this uh, bat tank actually having captured a bunch of people sitting on the ground and they do look like the mutants. If you guys read uh, DC Comics, there's this group of people called the mutants. It's not the same as the mutants from the X-Men. This is from DC lore. And they are wearing a bunch of visors. They're kind of like very future-esque uh, characters that, that are spawns of uh, meta humans and whatever. So you can like read about that as well. Uh, then uh, you get a shot of uh, Superman, you know, opening up his shirt to do the super Superman style uh, takeoff. And you do get to see a shot of Wonder Woman holding the arrow of Artemis, actually wanting to return to Themyscira to meet her mom. Uh, lastly, you come to a scene, and I like this. You don't get you, these are not post-credit scenes, right? These are all pre-credit scenes. We don't get post-credit scenes in this, and I like that. I like how uh, Zach is an absolute mad lad. So we find out that uh, Lex Luthor has been brought out of Arkham uh, Asylum. Uh, we, we don't get to see how it happens, but uh, we do get to see that he's been replaced by someone else and he has left Arkham and he's on a boat now recruiting, uh, not really recruiting, but rather calling out for, um, uh, what is, what's his name? Deathstroke and Deathstroke comes on board and uh, you know uh, Wade Wilson right Wilson comes on board and Lex Luthor tells him that uh, the identity of the Batman is Bruce Wayne and Wade Wilson decides that this will be a good uh, what do you call this a good collaboration for him and decides to agree with Lex right after that with no explanation no uh, warning of a timeline uh, nothing like that we straight away get uh, into a new nightmare sequence and in this nightmare sequence, uh, we actually see uh, the world already in ruins. Uh, we see the Batman. So this is all part of the reshoots, the additional photography uh, that Zack Snyder was doing. So all of this is like, uh, I think, less than five. It's like less than 10 minutes, slightly over five minutes or something like that. And in this additional photography, photography we see that the, rema the remaining members of the League are uh, Batman, uh, Cyborg, Flash, Mera. And uh, they have Deathstroke on the team, and Joker is there. Uh, and Batman is looks like he's just meeting up with the Joker to make a truce with him. And the dialogue between Jared Leto's Joker and Ben Affleck's Batman was just so good. My God, these dialogues! It's like uh, they're really making you like these two while hating these two uh, because of just how stupidly annoying Joker is. Like, his laugh is so annoying and you really feel like you want to kill him. But you know you can't because the Joker probably has something that Batman wants and I'm guessing it's most likely what they will need to send Flash back to the right point in time. 
Uh, and uh, the reason I think that is also so is because Joker is aware of the uh, multiple or rather parallel universes that uh, Batman has to destroy in order to get his objective done because uh, Joker most likely knows about how this time travel thing works. So, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the references to Harlequin as well as uh, how... The, how Robin was killed is also made and uh, I felt those dialogues were absolutely brutal and uh, someday we may actually get to see the story of how uh, Joker and Robin fought and I believe Zack has mentioned that uh, Robin doesn't go down easy he does go down swinging and uh, that would be absolutely amazing to see it'll basically look like a young Batman uh, except obviously as Joker says why did you send a boy wonder to do a man's job and uh, yeah, you, you don't you don't send that against the Joker, right? The Joker is just gonna break you, uh, and so I feel I feel that this is the last father, the father figure of what the Batman was to his adopted son, uh, which is Robin, and I felt that that was really painful to realize that all of this is still part of a father twice over, and this scene ends with Superman come coming crashing down, and you can see he's back in his red and blue suit. So it is possible that there was another transition of the suits and Superman is, he really looks like um, the Injustice Superman about to, about to obliterate whatever's left of the league and uh, Batman wakes up from his dream. So all of that nightmare sequence turns out to actually be a little dream for the Batman and uh, I mean, by now, I'm sure Bruce realizes that these dreams are reoccurring and for some reason he is getting flashbacks of a parallel timeline. It is possible that it, it, this is something in the past, in another timeline, or in the future, in a new timeline that, that is yet to unfold. Regardless, uh, I'm pretty sure he would want to highlight this uh, quite soon to the rest of the league. Then uh, we get to see Martian Manhunter drop by and say hi and say I'm here to help. I finally realize I have a stake in this world and whatever. You, you, you cow, you've been missing for like three films. But you see, the thing is that in this shot is when Zack was supposed to introduce Green Lantern. John Stewart Green Lantern, mind you, but was forced to put in Martian Manhunter because the studio didn't allow him to introduce a lantern because they said that they have... Um, they have their own plans for a Green Lantern, which, if it is not as good as what Snyder has been planning, I swear. Anyway, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would be really, really upset, okay? I would be really, really upset. We almost got to see the entire league in a single film, and they had to take that away from Snyder. Uh, so, uh, I like how Manhunter says that your, your parents, your mom and dad would be proud and you get to see a little emotional scene of Ben in the morning waking up to an alien greeting him and feeling emotional and to wanting to just go back to bed. And uh, yep, that's pretty much it. In the background of this shot, you actually get to see the Hall of Justice under construction and... Uh, I mean, it's not too far from where Bruce Wayne sleeps. So I think at this point, Bruce Wayne doesn't really care much about who figures out that he is actually Batman because uh, he's more concerned about the future that is at stake and a world that may not be around in the next few years. So I feel that overall, uh, if you followed my, if, if you went through my non-spoiler review, uh, this was definitely one of my most favorite superhero films and it is a beautiful film it's a whole different film i like how all man of steel bbs and justice league are all very unique films uh yet are very uh you know the style of snyder is there uh the, the the concept of the characters the development of the characters the weight the importance of these characters none of them are taken lightly the stakes are always high and uh, yet we get such unique uh, styles of filmmaking. The first one being uh, focused on a solo character. The second one about two characters spitting up against each other in a very brooding uh, fight uh, and, a, and a death of Superman. And the third one, you get to see the League uniting, coming back to uh, a brighter world where they want to fight for the future and not against each other. And uh, it's such a beautiful growth. And I would be upset if it ends here. And uh, well... This is it from me. Uh, I'm, I'll not be reviewing these in future episodes. This is the end. Uh, so thanks so much for watching. If you guys stuck around from the beginning, well, I thank you once again. And I would really like to hear your thoughts, your opinions. And I really wish, um, you know, I really wish Zack Snyder the best uh, in whatever his future undertakings are. Be it if he wants to stay with the DCEU and... Uh, 
Warner Brothers or whether he just wants to do his own thing uh, or any other film. I really hope that whatever the case, case is, no one ever takes his vision for granted. Uh, no one ever abuses a director uh, and, you know, shuns or shuts off their vision uh, just because they want to sell toys. Uh, I, I feel that these are important things that we have to take note, especially now we live in a world where people are more aware of uh, corporate sabotage. People are more aware about the inside uh, work and efforts that are being put by these amazing uh, artists, uh, which is what they all are, be it the graphic designers, be it the actors, be it the directors, the, the you know, the photographers, the, those in charge of filmography, those in charge of audio and music, uh, the stunt, you know, the stunt doubles and whatever, you know, even the Oscars doesn't have an award for stunt doubles, which they really should, because uh, they need to recognize all the effort put into filmmaking. Uh, so I feel that there's a lot more uh, in time that we will learn and the same way we put weight in a lot of other things like maybe in football per se or tennis or you know uh, like uh, maybe uh, you know in any other job or, or whatever the fact it is in real life I feel that we should learn to care for those uh, creative geniuses out there because they make our world a whole lot better and we got to look at it that way um, all right regardless uh, this is my uh, spoiler review of the film as it comes to an end uh so thanks so much for watching once again and i'll i'll see you guys take care